just like to introduce to our colleagues today, um, Andrew, who I've done some work with over at Batteringa, uh, Renee, who's joined us from um, her consulting business out of Canberra, welcome Renee, and Peter Thomas, um, who's the Chief Operating Officer for the Regions Hospital. I'll just ask you all to just give us a little bit of a background on yourself, if you wouldn't mind. Do you want to start, Andrew? Sure, yeah. So I'm Andrew. I, um, I'm head of uh, cardiorenal metabolism TA with Beringer Ingelheim, so I've been in the um, pharmaceutical industry probably 25 years. I'm a vet by background, but um, predominantly, probably a little unusual in, in our business in that we're still very much involved in primary care rather than specialty care, although the business is, is transitioning at the moment. So good to be here. Um, good morning, I'm Peter Thomas, uh, Chief Operating Officer, I'm also Chief Medical Officer in North Beaches, which is probably private partnership in New South Wales. Um, background, um, started up life as an intensivist um, in the UK, you can probably tell from my accent, and then came across to um, Australia, I've been a health executive for the past 15 years, um, in a number of different roles, but particularly I've worked in regional rural New South Wales, um, big redevelopments out in the in public hospital, and venture into um, this interesting uh, paradigm of the triple B in New South Wales. Um, and probably on the back of that, I do a lot of work with the federal government on the national clinical workforce strategy, the scope of clinical practice review, and some of the other uh, workforce strategies that's currently, um, I suppose we're working through some strategies um, with the Department of Health and um, um, My name is Renee. Um, I too have a clinical background um, as a pharmacist originally, but I work uh, as an advisor to the health sector these days. Um, I particularly work, uh, my firm in the health works broadly across health, but I particularly work in life sciences. Um, and I, we do a lot of policy work on a Canberra basis, and I guess we understand how the town works. We do a lot of policy work, but I particularly also do a lot of work on um, PBS pricing. So previously was an advisor to the PBSC. The committee that um, uh, I guess, um, decides what's subsidised in the country, so I have a deep understanding of health technology assessment. I started with the biggest issues facing healthcare systems and operators in Australia. Um, so we're talking about the very macro picture, and I think based on our conversation, we've all got a different perspective on that. Renee, would you like to lead us off on your thoughts on that? Well, I think one of the things that Andrew um, said about I guess how the equipment all come from the medicines angle is that a lot of the therapies and innovations that are being developed are in specialty care um, and primary care is the vast majority of how people access their medicine. The workforce is absolutely challenged in the way and the model of how we deliver care in Australia. If we take it to delivering health care services, whether that be in the public or private or even across the community sector, um, there's no doubt the biggest challenge that we're facing um, is workforce. Um, how to best manage the workforce to improve and retention. Um, I think across the whole sector we had an issue post COVID. Um, Australia has traditionally relied on overseas recruitment um, and increasingly those support services that we have, such as IT support, we're looking at expertise from overseas to actually um, <coughs> develop and enhance our digital capability. So we've got our frontline workforce, the traditional doctors, nurses, I think um, on top of that, all, all the things that we need to actually deliver healthcare in an integrated way. If we think about um, you know, digital health strategies that all of us are, um, I suppose, trying to implement, um, trying to get expertise in that is also a problem. You know, the, the growth in chronic disease within the community, I mean, the, the burden that that's going to put on, um, on resourcing, we're already seeing it, but it's going to get bigger and bigger. And I think, I think to Renee's point, you know, the, the, the ability to provide equity of access to medicines, but also equity of access to healthcare, I think to Peter's point, both within, you know, metro centres, but within, within communities in rural or regional Australia, clearly that's a huge issue. And I think linked to that around, around chronic disease is the role of primary care, and clearly primary care is, well, I think, you, know, you could say it's in crisis at the moment, I think, um, and that's not un unusual just to primary care, but, but there are you know, huge cracks in the system at the moment. So CAR T, pretty topical now. Where do we go? So that's a product that we've seen in the public domain now. Uh, we know it works, it's recognized um, 
medication, not reimbursed yet, probably getting a bit of a whack at every time they go to the advisory committee. Where do they go with that? What, what's your thoughts? Well, it's really interesting story as the focus of the minute, like the journey of it, I moved since 2017. It's different depending on the patient population. This is the really interesting thing to me. So, how to eat. I don't know what the price is. I, I choose not to know unless I absolutely need to know when I do work with companies. But it's widely reported it's half a million dollars. So let's just run with that as, as a price. Um, give anyone sticker shock, right? And that's just the cost of the product, let alone the cost of delivery. Um, but for a small patient population, paediatric ALL, 24 kids a year, it's kind of counterintuitive numbers, you know? But for a multiple myeloma cohort, which is 800 to 1,000 patients a year, that's very, very different. Um, it's a fixed line, you know, these patients have been through a hell of a lot before they're actually even able to be offered CAR-T. States and territories are in there, throwing stones a bit, putting sticks in the wheel, you know, saying it's gonna cost us thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to deliver it. Um, and the actual innovation of the technology gets lost in the discussion. You know, the value, there was a gentleman, Jeff Nyson, who was quite an advocate for the off-myeloma, unfortunately, we funded him millions of dollars as a country to go overseas and get the treatment in the US from the MTOP program, and it's a medical treatment overseas program, and he's, he's now in remission. This is a man who, you know, is 50, turning 50 this year, he's 42 when he was diagnosed, the median age is 80. So really unusual <coughs> patient, still much to contribute to society, and now he's in full remission. So it undoubtedly works in a lot of patients. There's always patients it doesn't work for. One of better words are post-COVID good in activities. And all of a sudden now we've got this, this escalating cost of living process issues over the last 18 to 24 months. So how do we respond? How do, how do industry operators respond? So maybe I'll start, Andrew, if I may. With you. What's, how have your, how's your organisation and what do you see your peers doing in terms of dealing with these burdening issues around costs associated with, as uh, <coughs> Peter has talked about, the staff and the shortages of staff. So it becomes a, 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 a spiral upwards because we offer to, to keep the right people or hold people stop people transiting? But for us, I think it's all about culture. Um, clearly, you have to support, you know, you have to support people through these times. It's difficult and you need to, you know, where you can provide monetary support in terms of, you know, um, their, their compensation, that's fine, but there's a limit to what you can do there. So it's, I, I think people come to work not just to earn <coughs> you know, their daily bread. Clearly, that's very important to them. But I think in terms of their purpose is, yeah. is critical. So I think if we can if we can ensure that um, yeah people understand the purpose of the company that they understand their own part within that um, I, you know we talk a lot about empowerment and we struggle with that I have to say I think as an industry or certainly as a company but I think it's probably true to the industry I think you know it's more and more process that we put in place which sometimes can prohibit empowerment. But we certainly try to empower people. You know, often people will stay e even though they could earn more elsewhere because of the people they work with, because of the culture, because of, as I say, the purpose, intent, and values of the organisation. So I think they're the things that, you know, you have to keep constant because during good times, that's great, but it's during times like this when those are really the things that keep people sticking. Yeah. And, um, and, and people will. You know, we'll show you pretty quickly if, if you haven't got those things right. Expanding that onto your broader, the broader question yeah. of going to market. Yeah. Yeah. What do you what do you want to do? Two things in terms of our go to market. We're transitioning from this sort of broad primary care markets into the specialty care markets, probably a bit later than others. But I think there's two things. One is just being incredibly close to the patient and understanding that. That's something we've always tried to do, um, but I think becomes more and more important. And that's, you know, we talk a lot about patient journeys and understanding the, the patient journey and understanding, you know, the, the barriers of patients, but really truly understanding them, not just what's on a piece of paper. And the second, I think, is about value delivery. And, um, and, it, and again, we've talked about the value delivery for the payer, but it's value delivery for, you know, for, for all of the stakeholders, for the payer, for the patient, for the, 
you know, for the healthcare professional, whether it be a pharmacist, whether it be a, a, a general practitioner, whether it be a cardiologist, because the, the value proposition is going to be different for each of them. And, and so it's about um, being able to demonstrate, communicate, engage around that value proposition for each of those each of those particular stakeholders. And that's not easy. Um, you know, it's not a one size fits all. But that, that's also much more rewarding as well um, for the people who are working for us. Um, so if we start with people, I think it's really important. So we talk about um, recruitment and retention. I think um, Andrew's point about culture is absolutely critical. Um, I suppose as healthcare providers, we see vocational um, vocational drive is as important. So what people are doing, what they're providing to their community is as important um, in many cases as um, as salary. So I think you're right. You know, it, it's really important to think about what culture uh, you have in the organisation. But constantly engaging with the workforce is critical to retention. So I think. Um, recruitment is um, it's one step, but actually keeping those people, especially those experienced people that can help um, deliver, um, deliver the search you're trying to do is, is absolutely important. And just talk about the last topic we had on our conversation today, which was digital health. Okay, we had a, a digital health project last year from the government, they published a significant report. Um, where, how, how is digital health really going to enable? Interested in your thoughts? I think it's interesting because um, in the hospital sector, we've been more and more across to the digitalised medical records or the MRIs, um, you know, um, uh, electronic medical prescribing. If we think about what the feds have done in the investment in safe scripts and safe prescribing and trying to, to have the prescriptions for you know, high cost service medications, all of that is great. Um, however, I think the biggest issue that we're facing is twofold. Um, we have a lack of interconnectivity, it's very clear. You talked about putting monitoring systems. Um, we have been looking at partnering uh, with a particular group, but it's about who owns, who owns the data whilst it's being transferred between, you know, the, the community, the healthcare provider who's responsible so I think there are, once we have a proper um, legislative framework for digital health and indeed AI, and um, I'll talk about that in just a second, I think I think that's one of the biggest barriers because we have a lack of uh, connectivity, people have their own uh, platforms, interfaces and different cybersecurity requirements. Um, and so when we're trying to partner um, in our organisation, we're partnering with eight or nine different providers to have an integrated digital system, which makes it almost impossible from um, the IT architect perspective. And it makes it very, very difficult from product um, compatibility. And also from the end user point, if we go back to the patient, the clinician on the front line who's trying to use these different systems, um, it, it, it just isn't easy. So I think that's a big barrier. And I agree that we are layered. Um, and, you know, we, we do, you know, 1% of, you know, the health, you know, the pharmaceutical market, the 1% probably the digital market as well. I don't know the, the stat for that. And so we watch and wait and, and, and we do that too often. I'm most helpful for that sort of like grassroot um, digital interface to work than I am at the top level. <clears throat> I think it'll be a ground up, a ground up innovation because I think the patients will drive it and they will want it. And then that will drive the systems to be able to um, because a patient at high, you know, hypertension is a perfect example. Many, many people suffer from white fat syndrome. They go up to the doctor and the measurement that they get there is, is not their true measurement. It's actually the best place for them to take a lot of their observations. So I'm the most hopeful for that. I was reading a report from the American Medical Association and I think that the, the bulk of physicians there, they, they talked about all of the opportunities, particularly around AI in terms of patient care. But, a big focus of it was actually just around the, all the administrative burden. And I wonder if, you know, is there an opportunity even in that situation in the hospital, you know, to do translational services or whatever. I, I don't know all the technical terms for the AI um, sort of algorithms, etc. But, you know, to, to actually strip some of the administrative burden off uh, clinicians. And I think, I think particularly in primary care, 
perfect opportunity, but in order to do that, you've got to have that interoperability of data and that, that, that sort of um, sharing of data. But that seems to me, you know, outside of the clinical care of patients, maybe that actually would free up a bit of time. Um, now, how you do that, I don't have all the answers. Um, I, and I think the other, you know, probably the other question for me is around trust. So I, I think, you know, is there enough trust in, in um, around security, cyber security? Um, so that's, a, you know, that's a big issue, I think, that we have to address. But I think, I think we can all see that the, the opportunities are enormous.